me uh, mechanism design which I kind of introduced last time. Talked about last time basically about uh, uh, these global orderings and so on. And um, actually, I should make one comment on that. Is Chan here? It's missing. Okay. Chan had asked this question what can a dictator? Dictatorship is that, you know, in Arrow's theorem, we had this notion of uh, a dictatorship. It said that if you have uh, in independence of ir irrelevant alternatives, oh, there you are, sorry. You can usually sit over there. <laughs> independence of irrelevant alternatives, and you have the uh, strict ordering, uh, you know, then based, and you have this unanimity, then you're going to get a dictatorship. And, uh, what, you know, but then the dictatorship uh, basically only means that. Uh, the global outcome matches some individual outcome, some individual's orderings, and uh, that's true. Okay, so I went and read about it some more. In fact, I found a paper called Three Simple Proofs of Arrow's Theorem." So I went and read three proofs of Arrow's Theorem, and so I made a slight mistake. I said you need to have a strict ordering. It turns out that Arrow's Theorem works even if you have ties. So you need a total ordering, but you can't have. Uh, so all orderings are transitive, but we can have equivalence classes. That's okay. However, dictatorship still means that the global ordering matches some individuals. Interestingly enough, if you take that individual's ordering and that individual changes preferences, that doesn't change the order, global ordering necessarily. It just means somebody else becomes a dictator. Okay. So I asked one of my colleagues, uh, Kate Larson, I said, "What can a dictator is it who can't have any power?" You know, it's like, well, if I change my mind, somebody else becomes dictator. Okay, that's not a good dictator to have. You won't be, you know, all powerful and say, this is the global ordering and I say so and, you know, everybody's got to listen to me. Well, unfortunately, that's not the way it is. So, apparently, in this line of research, you define your terms in such a way as to make the theorems look good <laughs> and a cynical view of things. But uh, apparently, uh, dictatorship is defined in this way to make the theorem work. In practice, it's got nothing to do with the real dictatorship. So, so this is just a technical definition of dictatorship. Uh, so I was somewhat uh, uh, disappointed to hear this because, of course, I want to be a dictator, you know, and change the preference orderings. In this case, it's not you can't do that. It, all this means is there's, there exists uh, the global ordering will match some individuals' orderings, which is a kind of weak form of pretty weak form of dictatorship anyway. So. Uh, unfortunately, I also discovered that the Arrow theorem keeps get, getting trotted out. You know, all sorts of people point to it as the you know why voting will not work and this and that and the other, and they all say, well, it will end up in a dictatorship, but they don't understand the the dictatorship here is meant in a strictly technical sense. So I think uh, uh, that theorem has gotten much more mileage than it should have, as far as I can understand it. So anyway, so thanks for asking that question because I went and dug up a lot more. And this is a theorem that doesn't have too much teeth, too many teeth. Anyway, having said that, I'm going to kind of go into, uh, so that was what you discussed last time more or less. What I'm going to talk about today is this, you know, sort of the engineering part of game theory. How do you design games that make people do what you want them to do? So I, I outlined the problem uh, uh, last time, uh, you know, very briefly, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail today. And then the next class, we'll go into a particular mechanism in considerable more detail. I'll start with a mechanism called price discrimination mechanism. This is roughly what happens when you go to a store and they say you can buy one for a dollar or two for you know dollar fifty or okay, and ten for whatever, right? How do you choose these prices? So that's what price discrimination is about. And we'll see what the hidden assumption is in price discrimination. Then we get into this auction, the Vickery auction, or the second price auction. This is the most famous mechanism out there. In fact, it probably the success of this is the uh, pretty much the basis of mechanism design. As one of the authors writes, uh, all of mechanism design is nothing more than footnotes to the Vickery auction. So we'll talk about that and how that works. And that will allow us to discuss you know, properties of a desirable mechanism and then uh, an important principle called the revelation principle, which allows us to simplify the space of all possible mechanisms to a much smaller class called uh, direct revelation uh, mechanisms. So just to fix ideas, so yeah? Spells like Did I make a mistake here? Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, are you sure? I keep making a mistake here. Wow. Okay. Ari, why? Thank you. I've cons consistently misspelled it. I always thought it was Vickery. 
you know, I must be uh, dyslexic or this something. I don't know what. Let me fix that over here. Okay. Okay, let me go. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what, what is price discrimination all about? So, price discrimination basically says that, let's say you're a, you want to sell some good, and you know something about your customers. You know something called your value, the valuation. Okay. So the valuation of a customer is how much they value the good. And last time I said, okay, here is the you know the, the chalk duster. You know somebody values it ten cents, somebody values it so many thousand dollars. That's the internal value that a particular individual ascribes to the item. So uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to assume that I want to sell something and that the buyers have some internal valuation and I know the valuation. So let's start, let, so I came up with this thing called a U-phone. It's like an iPhone but better. <laughs> and, the two, and the two classes of people who buy it, okay? So the class, the, the people who, the, the, you know, the chatters for C, and then uh, A is the antediluvians. I can spell this properly, I think. Does anybody know what an antediluvian is? Antiquated ode. Antiquated ode, yeah, but that's not the precise meaning. Anybody know what antediluvian is? So, <laughs> anti means before. Uh, diluvian is the deluge, so the big flood, you know, the Noah, Noah's Ark, which was supposed to rescue people. These are all the people who are so old, they served they were from before Noah's Ark. So they're antediluvians. These are in particular people who don't know what a U-phone is, and they don't have any friends who have U-phones. So these guys only buy one, because all their friends have U-phones already, but these guys have to buy two, because they're going to buy one for each end, and the U-phones only talk to other U-phones. I just needed acronyms for A and C, so I just picked anti deliverance and chatters. Anyway, so we have this guy. Now, uh, I have to price the U-phone somehow. So let's say I want to sell it. I just say, okay, it costs $100. Okay, now I just pick a price. Now, how do you, how do you manufacturers set the price anyway, right? I mean, how does Apple decide that an iPhone costs whatever it is? To, to, it costs two hundred dollars, and then they say, no, actually we meant one fifty, and actually we meant ninety nine, and but the newer model is three hundred. You know, prices keep changing. Where are these prices coming from? There's some cost, obviously. There's some in, internal cost of you know silicon and manufacturing process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, there is very little relationship between price and cost. Okay, uh, uh, pr pr cost is what it costs to make. Price is what anybody will pay for it. And you know the two are very far apart. Okay, the obvious case of this is is water. You know, you <laughs> most water you buy in bottled water, the actual cost of the goods inside is somewhere under one tenth or one cent, and it usually sells for somewhere between one and two dollars. So uh, <laughs> if you buy bottled water, it is uh, you, you know you're better off buying cocaine than bottled water in terms of the uh, markup, you know, <laughs> of the of the goods. Especially considering that these people just get it from the tap anyway. You know, they're not get, it's not coming from any particular spring. Anyway, so uh, having put that in a footnote, let me come back to this. I pick a price, hundred dollars. And, but I make two mistakes. The first mistake I make is the chatters, they, you know, the young students, they only can afford 50 bucks. That's an internal valuation, let us say. Nobody's going to buy it, okay? And the antediluvians anti are people about the age of 40, right? And they can afford 300 each, right? So they can pay 600 bucks, but you're only charging them 100. So you're getting short on both sides. You're not taking as much money from these guys as you could, and you're not... Uh, you, the chargers will never buy it, right? So you can see what's going on. You have, you know, in this case, you only have one single uh, good that you're selling, one single price point. And if you are smart, you know, you could say, well, I, I'll set it at 50 or 49.99, and then I'll get all of these guys and I'll lose some money here. But this market is so big, that's okay, right? That's one decision you could make. Alternatively, you could say, I'm going to price it at 600 for two. You can't get one. You only can buy two. Six hundred for two. We'll take these guys out, but we get all the money we can from here. That's also a possible thing. All these decisions require you to know the internal valuations of these members. Okay. So to go back to this, and you price at one hundred, you're basically wrong, 
Okay, you, you're, you're alienating, uh, you, can't, you can't sell to these guys, and you're leaving money on the table. So what could you do? So the answer is that let's say the internal valuation of charters is C, and the internal valuation of these guys is A. Okay? Now, what you can do is you can say, oh, wait a minute. I know that these guys are only going to buy one, and these guys are always going to buy two. Okay? So you can come up with a very simple price discrimination scheme. What does it say? Well, if you buy one, you should sell it for C. What are it is, you should buy one for C. Now, what about two? Okay. Now, if you price for the price for two is more than two C, these guys have money, but they're also not dumb, right? They just buy two of these, right? So it's got to be less than two C. We know that's less than two C, right? It's certainly greater than C. So it's something in between, right? And uh, what we have to do basically, we know what uh, we know what A is. So we're going to actually pick essentially uh, the min of these two. Okay, we don't know 2A and 2C. Just pick the min of these two, of 2A and 2C. Okay, because uh, otherwise it's you know it can't be greater than 2C, and the value of this is you know it's uh, each one is worth A, so you're going to buy 2A. So you know you should you should get that if you can. Right? If their total valuation, for example, in this is, so one is for 50, well, two can't be more than 100. So you can say, let's say they're willing to pay 80, then you price it for 80, 80, uh, 80 each. Or if they have pricing a different one, you know, basically you have to pick something so that it's lower than 100, because they won't pay more than 100 for two if you're going to price one at 50. So here what we're doing is that we choose these prices in such a way such that if you know the internal valuation, you can optimally pick the pricing for both categories of, 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 of the uh, target consumer population. Okay? So, so that is, in fact, the optimal price discrimination scheme or discriminative, discriminative pricing scheme. And you see it all the time. You see it all the time. Whenever you go buy something, you say, well, it's a volume discount. Right? What they're really doing is they're saying that some people will buy it in bulk. And some people will buy it individually. And you know, if you go to a store and you look at packaging sizes, you know, you'll find that a small uh, toothpaste, for example, is far more in, in terms of uh, a, a price than a larger one. So if you know, because, but then people don't want to get a big amount of toothpaste, right, or, or whatever. So, so you, you, you do this. And how do you find these internal valuations? You do it through trial and error, essentially. You, know, you, cannot tweet, you keep tweaking it. And at some point, you say, OK, I'm getting these kinds of buyers. And so that's good. And uh, that's why you know, when you go to a grocery store, they give you a discount if you belong to their club, by the way. So if you belong to this shopper's club, whatever it is, what they're doing is they're getting all the information on you. So chances are, if you're buying diapers, it's very unlikely you're a single student. Okay? If you're buying diapers every week, chances are pretty good you're, you have a family. And so they can say, yeah, this guy belongs over here. What are the other price points they bought for? If you take it up, do they buy more? Do they buy less? And they get very, very targeted advertising. Uh, sorry, not targeted, targeted pricing points chosen so that they know exactly how much you're willing to pay. And they price it just at that point. And uh, it, there, is a, there is a science to it. Okay? So the bottom line of all this is that lots of things are possible if you know the internal valuation. <coughs> but this is actually private. Okay, we don't actually know people's internal valuation. So the whole point in mechanism design is to be able to come up with these kinds of price discrimination type mechanisms in the absence of information about internal valuations. In other words, to make people tell you what the valuation is. And to do that, I'm going to go to, to this thing called the victory auction. Okay? So uh, what is an auction? So an auction, what happens is, uh, Constantine, you can sit over there if you want. There's a chair right there. Okay? And because I'm going to use this part of the board, and you won't be able to see it. So an auction is a market which has one seller and many buyers. And the goal is for the seller to get the maximum possible price. If the seller knew the internal valuation of all the people in the audience, all the potential buyers, there's no problem. Computes the max, sets the price to be slightly below the max, you know, one cent below the max, and it sells it, and it's done. Of course, it doesn't know this. So what you use instead is something that gives you less money than that. But in fact, it allows you to, do, uh, allows you to, to get a pretty decent outcome, which is to tell people to tell, force people to tell the truth. So what's a victory auction?
So it has basically three steps. One is announce, uh, sorry, uh, each uh, bidder announces a bid. Okay. Two, you compute the max and the second uh, price, which is basically the one just below the max. And then a bidder who bids max wins, OK, and pays second price. So let's say the bids were you know, 1, 1, sorry, 1, 1, 5, 8, 10 from five bidders. And the person who bid 10 would win, and they would pay 8. They wouldn't pay 10, they'd pay 8. Okay? So it's a very simple rule. And you say it's so simple, you know, but uh, how come it does uh, what you expect it to do, which is how come it tells people to tell the truth? So what do we mean by telling the truth? What I mean is that each bidder is going to actually tell you the true internal valuation. So if somebody internally feels that the true valuation is five, they will actually bid five. They will not bid six or seven or three or something like that. So just think of that for a second. So you go to an auction, there's somebody auctioning some kind of uh, a painting or something like that. Um, you may want to bid higher than you actually feel it's worth or lower because you want to strategically manipulate the outcome, right? For example, you know somebody is going to bid a lot, and you know you want them. To, you know you don't want them to win. You know you, you just want to raise the bid, and then last minute you drop off, forcing them to pay higher, right? Something like that. You can do all sorts of tricks in, in auctions. Um, this one forces you to tell the truth. Okay. So why does it do that? Let's analyze what it's going to do, and then you'll see what's going on in a victory auction. So. The way to think about it is really in the, in, the, in the form of a game, in the form of a game tree. So what I'll show you is that if you lie, okay, if you lie, you are either worse off or the same as as telling the truth. Or in other words, telling the truth is uh, uh, better than or as good as lying in all circumstances. And so. Uh, telling the truth is a dominant strategy because you're greater than or equal to, right? So telling the truth, the strategy of telling the truth is greater than or equal to the uh, valuation or the outcome if you lie. Okay, so let's just take, so basically I'm just going to start with lying because it's easier to analyze from lying than from telling the truth. So let's just start like this. If you lie and your true valuation is something you can tell, either you can, you can bid higher or you can bid lower. Okay, that's basically the only two choices, because if you tell the if, you, if it's tell the truth, then you say exactly what it is, right? You can higher or lower. If you tell higher, let's go in this case, then either you win or you lose. Okay. So, if you lie and you tell higher than your true valuation and you win, right? It doesn't matter because you're not going to pay what you said. Right? So go back to the example, let's say you're, true, you're the winner and your true value, your valuation is 10 and you said 20. Right? You're going to pay 8 anyway. So this doesn't really matter whether you said 20 or 8. If you win, it doesn't really matter, so we don't care. Okay? What happens if you said higher than what you wanted and you lose? Okay? You didn't pay anything. The outcome is essentially not relevant. Okay? So it doesn't really matter. There is a sort of a footnote to this. In fact, it's a footnote in the text. You could lie and say higher just to force somebody else to pay higher. So in other words, you could be at, your real valuation could be 7, right? And you could bid 8. Why are you bidding 8? Because somehow you know you're going to lose, and you want to force the other person to pay 8 instead of 7. OK? They say, look, I'm going to lose anyway. I may as well say 7. I'm as well say 8 instead of 7 because I want the winner to pay more. You know, I'm just being malicious for no good reason. It could happen except that valuations are considered to be private. OK? So I don't really know. OK? So suppose my true valuation was 7. 
Okay, the true violation is seven, and I bid eight. Potentially, okay, I could win, okay, at eight, and potentially there's somebody else out there who bids 7.9, for example. I'd be willing, to, I'd be forced to pay 7.9, but my only valuation is seven, so I had a negative, you know, a 0 0.9, because I got something which I value at seven and I paid 7.9, I'm going to lose 0 0.9, and if I did, if I tell the truth, Okay, I wouldn't win at all. I would lose, and my valuation would be zero. So I'm better off telling the truth. You see what I mean? So if you lose, either it's zero or, you know, you could have a negative even depending on if you're trying to kind of artificially boost your, uh, your, your, your valuation in order to cause somebody else to, to pay higher. Okay, you can't do that. Okay, you might actually you might accidentally win. Now, if you have confidence that somebody is going to have a higher valuation than you, for sure they're going to win, then, okay, then you can play these games. But in this, as I'm sure, assuming over here, we don't have any prior information about the other people. Okay, so this is a dominant strategy. If you have, uh, if it change, game changes if you have Bayesian, then you have some expectations, etc. We're not going to consider that. Okay, what about if you lie and you're going lower? Either you win, again, or you lose. So if you win, Again, you're not paying what you, what you actually said. Yeah. On a win. No, if you say, if you, if you say you're, you're bidding higher. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, uh, let me put it like this. No, this is, this is negative. Yeah, I guess it should be on a win. It's get, it's get, it's get, it gets a bit hairy if you go down that path. So you lose. If you actually do lose, okay, you get zero. Right? If you, if you tell a lie and you bid higher and you actually lose, it's okay. And I, I guess what you're saying is if you have a higher uh, and you kind of accidentally win. Okay, yeah, so you would be, uh, you'd be negative, you'd be, get, let, me, let me just see over here. So, uh, yeah, so actually that case comes in the later case, okay, which is, uh, let me see. Uh, okay, so if your true valuation was seven and you bid eight, right, and and you win, okay, uh, right. So if you that would be win and you lie. Oh, that's right. If you it's okay. You could, I guess there are two cases. Either you pay the uh, point yeah point nine or yeah. So you're basically going to have two cases. Win uh, where you are the second highest. Or second price is greater than true valuation, in which case you have a negative, right? And second price is less than, uh, sorry, second price is, uh, you lie, you tell higher, and second, yeah, so if the second price is greater than true valuation, it's negative, and if the second price is uh, lower, now this is getting confusing here, okay, you lie, you say it higher, you win, and you pay the second price. Yeah, if the second price is below your true valuation, uh, it gets positive. Is that right? Let me see. Um, I beg your pardon? It, it gets, it, it, okay, this is a second. The, the thing is, there are very many different ways of analyzing this, and it gets pretty messy. If you uh, start, okay, let's come back to that case over here for just a second. Let me just finish with the other thing and then I'll come back there because uh, it gets tricky. Okay, let's just go here, okay? If you, if you, if you lose and, you, so you say lower and you win, okay, uh, then you are, you are, you, you, you're still going to pay sort of the lower price, the second price, right? So there's no, you don't, there's no big deal over here because you're still paying the second price, right? Uh, so in that case, for example, let's say your true valuation was, was 20 and you actually bid 10 and somebody else bid 8. So you bid lower and you won, you still end up paying only 8. So you're fine. You don't, I mean, you don't gain anything. And if you bid lower and you lose, you get a negative. Why? Because you could have had it, right? You could have had the good for, a, for, your, for the price, but you, know, you actually lost it. So for example, your, your true valuation of 20, you only bid five, okay? And somebody else got it for eight, okay? Um, you, you would have gotten it for eight if you, you know, you, potentially you could have gotten it for eight. 
or, or whatever the, high, the second price was, so you lost this much over here. Uh, so the argument is that if you say something lower than what you uh, wanted to, uh, what, what you value it as, potentially you're going to lose the auction. Okay? And when you lose the auction, you're getting a negative outcome because you could have actually gained something. Okay? The gap between your valuation and the second price is what you could have gained, but you will not gain it because you lied. Okay? So, that, so basically, if you lie and you ask lower, you have negative or zero. And then over here, we have higher. If you lose, it's, uh, it's a zero. Uh, you know, there's, no, there's no consequence. And if you win, when you say higher, uh, if the second price is greater than true valuation, you're going to be negative, right? So let's write it on over here. So let's just say that your true valuation is here, and you bid higher. Let's say this is the value where you bid, and then the second price can be either here or it can be here. Okay. If the second price is below your true valuation over here, then uh, what is going to happen? So if the second price below. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's the same as the true value. You're not going to. It's not going to matter anymore. No, and if the second price is higher than the true valuation, then you're going negative, right? So in either case, you're covered. So basically, that's what I'm talking. That's what happens over here. So just to repeat. So this is my uh, true valuation. Is this? This is true. And the second price can be either to the right of me to the left of me. And this is my bid over here. The H bid is higher than true case over here. And then if it lies in this range, I'm going to pay the second price, but it's higher than the true valuation, so I lose, right? And if the second price is to the left of my true valuation, then uh, I'm going to pay the second price anyway. It doesn't matter whether I lied. I, would have, I could have said the truth, and I would not have been worse off anyway. So in any case, if the second price is negative over here, it's zero. So I guess this figure is explaining that piece over here. Okay. So the, you, basically, you have to look at all the different cases one by one, and uh, you find that in all cases, by telling the a lie either higher or lower, whether you win or you lose, and depending on even where the second price lies, you'll either be indifferent, you don't any, do any worse than telling the truth, or you're actually are worse off than telling the truth. And therefore, you shouldn't lie. And therefore, the outcome is for everybody assuming the rational people to tell the truth. Okay, so uh, so f before I move on, so any questions about this kind of figure over here? Okay, it's sort of a uh, fairly painful case-by-case uh, -case analysis, right? But what you need to convince yourself is that if you go through all these cases, you in fact end up with the result that Either you should, uh, that you should never lie. It's not, it, it can only hurt you, and it can, or, or uh, it will be indifferent. It'll, it'll never help you. Whereas if you tell the truth, in some cases you're better off, and in no case are you worse off. Okay. So, assuming that all the players are rational and they go through this analysis and they don't mess it up, then they are going to tell the truth. Okay, and they're going, to tell the they're going to tell the truth, and in this case, the bidder is going to bid their, whatever they're going to bid, they're going to bid the truth. And so what the uh, seller gets is, in fact, the true valuation that each person has. So this is great, right? What I've shown is that we're having this very, very simple rule over here that says each, you know, just announce a bid, compute the max, give me the second price. I have forced people to tell me the truth, because uh, if they're rational, they must tell me the truth. Yes. What if the price is now at five and someone suddenly asks for a hundred and then his true value is about eight dollars and he can get it for five? Okay, so the, the, all the bids are the simultaneous, yeah. Each bidder announces the bid simultaneously. It's not Yeah, it's a sealed bid or a simultaneous auction. You don't have this. If you do the raising auction, okay, it can, it can, you know, where I say, okay, somebody, I have five, will somebody give me six? Somebody has six, can somebody give me seven, etc. That will reveal the truth as well, right? Because everybody is going to essentially top off at the true valuation. The winner is going to be the one over here. There's a sealed bid auction or a simultaneous auction where all the bids are put in at the same time. 
Yes. No, it's not. That was the point I was going to come to as well. The seller would be maximizing its profits if it knew the true valuation was 10. And so that's why I did price discrimination first. So price discrimination is perfect, right? Because I know the true valuation. Here I'm losing something. I'm losing the gap between the true valuation and the second price in order for me to get the, so I'm paying something for it, okay? Hopefully not too much, but I'm paying something for it. Yeah, it's absolutely right. Yes. Yeah, so the reserve price is not really relevant over here. Okay, we can always say, well, if the bid is below my reserve, I'm not going to bid it, right? What we're trying to do is to say, well, what, what, what Omer's point was that uh, it, the, the, if I knew the true valuations, I could get the highest price. I would then say compute max and charge max. But I have to get the second price. You pay the second price. So the gap between the max and second price is the cost of, 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 of telling the truth. Okay, there's a cost to telling the truth. This is what the cost is. Or rather, it's a cost to make people tell you the truth. Okay? Yes? What's the problem with the obvious strategy of computing a max and making the person pay a max? If you tell the, uh, there is no incentive for somebody to tell you the truth uh, necessarily uh, if, you, if you have just a max. So if I tell people, uh, uh, t tell me what your uh, max value is, right? Uh, what prevents somebody from uh, bidding lower, okay? So uh, I guess I shouldn't do this on the fly. You, you ha people have studied that uh, max seal bid, uh, and it's called the English auction, I guess, and uh, they've shown that it, it can be strategically manipulated. I, re I can't remember the, off the top of my head what the exact scheme is to manipulate it, but there is a way to manipulate it. Uh, manipul yeah. All the second price bids below the. So if you announce one value and you pay that value, yeah. This property of that anything above the second uh, bid is equivalent goes away. Uh, yeah, yeah. See, but the uh, counter argument to that is that if you don't bid your two price, then uh, you know there is some possibility that you can bid a lower price and still win. You know, you pay less. So you have to analyze the cases pretty carefully over there, and I, I, I can't, I, know, I, I, I can't reconstruct that argument just right now. It's uh, hard enough reconstructing this. <laughs> okay. Any other questions about this? Okay, let's take a break. And uh, one over here, uh, which is implicit, is that this is an ordering on the on the outcomes, right? We have an outcome called you know bidder one wins, bidder two wins, bidder three wins, etc., right? And I've created a social ordering over here. And I just said earlier that you know social ordering will result in dictatorship, et cetera, et cetera. So what's going on? Why is it that we don't uh, have that problem over here? The reason we don't have the problem over here is because we're dealing with money. Okay? When I say that you, know, you, you, you prefer uh, you know, that you have a negative, you're losing money, we assume everybody has monotone preferences on money. So more money is better than less money for everybody. Okay? And that's why these things work over here. If you're just arbitrary preferences amongst goods without any money, then we would not be able to do the victory auction. We would, we would be running into the uh, gibbard uh result or the, uh, you know, or, or, or the Arrow theorem. So, so this is because we have what's called quasi-linear utility functions. OK. Uh, any questions about this? Any more questions? OK, so let me try and give you a little bit more formalization of the, of the math behind uh, b mechanism design. Okay. All right. So what we do is that uh, the, the game is being played. A mechanism is a game uh, that has two classes of players. So one is called the principal or P, and A is the uh, are the agents. So the principal is the person who makes the rules, okay, and the agents are the people who play the game. And what the principal wants to do is to essentially uh, come up with some kind of outcome, 
which is in the principal's interest. So the principal wants to do something so that the agents do the right thing. So in economics, there is a general thing called agency theory. Agency theory is the theory of how principals should set up the rules to have the appropriate outcomes. And mechanism design is essentially a branch of agency theory. So that's how it was started out in, 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 uh, in economics. And then mechanism design got hijacked by computer scientists <laughs> around, uh, I don't know, 1995 or so. And then after that, the economists said, say, oh, what happened to our field? You know, it's all invaded. So anyway. So what we have is a bunch of outcomes which we want, it's called O, and the number of outcomes is just mod O. Um, and so in our case, for example, when we had the, uh, the I'll just kind of keep a running example going over here. In the U phone case, so the principal is the seller or the manufacturer of the U phones. The agents are the customers. And the rules of the game are really you pay something and you buy the U phone. That's the game. Or you don't buy. Uh, in our case, the two outcomes, so we, have, uh, so we have N outcomes. So we have two outcomes, which are either uh, purchase or don't purchase. OK. I guess, uh, I, yeah. Maybe I should make it more precise. So maybe I should say uh, we have actually four outcomes, which are C purchases or does not purchase. And then similarly, A purchases, A does not purchase. And then if you see purchases, that outcome would be uh, you purchase one for the price of C, and A purchases two for the price of min of 2C and 2A. OK, so those are the two you know, outcomes that we want. The other two outcomes, you know, basically, we don't really care about. So in the notes, let's say we have two outcomes. Actually, it should be two outcomes. Uh, sorry, note says two. There should be four, actually. OK, now we have this notion of type. Okay, so the uh, ith agent has type T sub i. Okay, yeah. We're just looking at one customer at a time. So a customer comes in, the game is played with that customer. So either it purchases or doesn't purchase. And how come there's four? Well, the customer can be, um... I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, so basically for that customer, there's two outcomes possible, and then the other customer, there are two outcomes possible. Okay, so overall the game has, you know, given one customer at a time, basically I'm going to play a game with one customer at a time. So the two games, I should say, and each has two outcomes. Okay, maybe I should be more clear. Each type. These things are just, you know, uh, they're not particularly relevant, uh, in fact. The only thing that's important here is type. Okay? So a type of an agent is an encapsulation of its private knowledge. In particular, its internal value. Okay? So, so we just say TI belongs to class TI. So capital T is the set of all possible types that the ith agent could have. So you could have each agent be of a different type, potentially. But uh, you know, in this case, you know, these are the sets of possible types. and so. The type, so if you have n agents, well not n agents, m agents, you have t1 cross t2 cross whatever are the possible types, okay, the type space from which all the agents come from. This is just a standard, a standard way of representing that. So in our case, for example, if the agent is the, of type of C or of type A, okay, that's the type. And now they have an internal valuation, which is small a or small c. Right? That's, that's how much they value the U-phone. So, so the uh, types are um, T1 and T2. Well, we actually, uh, uh, at any given point, there's only one agent, okay, because you have a game with one person. So there's only T1, and they say the A or C, and then the internal valuation is A or C. 
OK? OK, so that's uh, the types. Now what you're going to do is you're going to assume that each agent uh, has a utility function, OK, which is u sub uh, i for the i agent. And it's, off the, it's quasi linear, so it's of the form um, outcome, comma, ti. So it just says that if my type is this and this is the particular outcome, I have some utility from it. And it's going to be um, having some value for money. I'll come, up, I'll come to that in just a minute. So in our case, uh, what we have is that the utility of C for uh, the outcome 1, comma C uh, and the type is C, internal valuation C is C minus C, which is 0. OK, so this is the internal valuation minus the price. So we have a price part to it. And the internal valuation for A, which is of min 2C, comma 2A, given the type is A, equals, uh, uh, sorry, given the price. All oh, right, OK, I was just going to use C. So OK, just give me a second here. Equals uh, C minus min. So I'm just showing the utility function for C. So if, if C is offered the price 1C, then it gets a utility of 0. right? That's what you want. You're saying your valuation is C. I'm going to charge you C. Your outcome is 0. right? If the C, the chatter, is going to be given the price that was set for A, then its type is C. It's uh, out, this outcome is 2C, 2A. Its uh, valuation is utility function is its values is at C and it's going to pay so much, it's going to be less than zero. All right? So it's not going to ask for it. It's not, so Chatter is not going to ask for two because that's what I'm showing over here because it doesn't make sense. Okay? This is just formalizing the statement that if they only want one and they're not going to get too much value from two, uh, then we want to make sure that they don't buy two. That two is going to be meant for the people who are going to buy two, the A's. Okay. All right. So let's see. Then we have this. This is the set of types over here. It's called the state of the world. It's all the different types that people are out there. So this is all the possible types out there. We assume we know this already. And what we want to do is to basically map from the the types. T1 cross T2, et cetera. Uh, how many you put over there? T. Yeah, so. Uh, okay, I guess I made a mistake over here. No, no, it's on, uh -huh. So N, N is the number of uh, agents. Uh, agents, okay. So each agent could have its own type. Sorry. So this is the state of the world, is T1 through Tn. I should probably use N over here as well. Um, OK. Uh, and we're going to basically go from these types into the outcome over here. Okay. In the case of the U phone, again, we, you know, we have a customer come in. That customer is either type A or C. Right? Those are the two types for that agent. And the outcome is either they purchase or they don't purchase at this particular price that we said over here. And so we want to have that mapping from the types to the outcome. And so what we want to do, what the principal wants to do, is the principal wants to have certain outcome happen. Principal prefers, so we have something called the social welfare function. We saw this before. So social welfare function, this is what the principal wants. OK. So again, in the U phone example, what, what the principal wants is that if the customer comes in and is of type C, they'll buy one, and they'll pay a price C. And if the customer comes in of type A, they'll buy two, and they'll pay, they'll pay the price that you want, uh, that you pay. So the min of 2C and 2A, they're going to pay. That's the outcome that the principal wants to have happen. Okay? So, so far, we have not said anything about mechanism. So far, all we're saying is, well, there are some agents that are different types, 
and we have some outcomes. We have some preferences on the outcomes. The principal has some preferences on the outcomes. What the principal wants to do is to go from these types to this particular outcome over here. Okay, there's no game so far. Okay, so how do we introduce a game? The way we do this is that we are going to uh, create a mechanism like this. So by the way, this outcome assumes that you know the true, you know the true state. P knows the true types. Okay, so if P knows the true types, then it can look at the types and just map it to the outcome. Okay, for example, by choosing a price discrimination mechanism, right? That's easy because I know the true value. Or in the case of an auction, if the uh, if the, state, the type of each person is really uh, how much their internal valuation is, if I know the true valuation, I just find the max and say, okay, you pay me that much. That's the outcome the principal wants, and that's easy. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to basically cause the outcome to happen by means of a game. So what we do is we define a mechanism M like this, okay? A mechanism that says, if these are the types, I'm going to have some strategies, okay? And then there's going to be an equilibrium. And the outcome of the equilibrium is the exact outcome I wanted in the first place, okay? So we have some strategies chosen from S1 to S2 to Sn. These are the strategy spaces of all the, uh, of the, of the players. What is the strategy space for UFON? It basically is, you know, I can basically buy or not buy. In case of victory auction, the strategies are what price do I bid? Okay, my bid is my strategy, okay? And in equilibrium, I'm going to come up with some set of strategies, the strategy profile S star, and this S star is going to have the right outcome, okay? So I'm going to define some function G on the S star, okay? Which says this is the rule that I apply on the strategy profile in equilibrium to give me the outcome. And what you want is to define the rules which allow these strategies such that when you play this game, you get the outcome that you want, okay? So let me try and do that with the Vickery auction for a second. So the true types of the people in the room, in this room, for example, let's say, okay, bid for this duster. The true types are what you value it for, okay, one cent, 10 cents, whatever, right? If I knew that, I could choose the outcome automatically. I can just say this, this is what the outcome is. However, what I'll do is this. I'll say, okay, I'm going to announce the rules of the game. I'm going to announce the rules that say each of you bid something, and you have to pay the second price, second highest price. That's the rules of the game. That's M, okay? When I have this M, you have this choice of strategy, the bids that you can place. Okay, and what I do is that at the end of it, I apply some rule G, which is, which is the, the rule G is part of the mechanism. Okay, it says uh, I'm going to take the uh, winner, which is the highest price, I'm going to pay the second price, that's what I'm going to say. And in equilibrium, what will happen is the outcome that I get over here from this game is exactly the outcome that I'd like to get uh, over here. Okay, now this may or may not be true. I mean, in the case as we discussed earlier, if you knew the true types, Vickery auction is not giving the exact outcome. The Vickery auction should be giving you uh, the amount of money which is the highest bid, okay? I'm not getting that. I'm getting almost there, right? I can get the second highest bid, but, uh, you know, so at least it's close, but it's not exactly what I get. That's the price of doing the mechanism over here, okay? I think I'm losing a lot of you, so I'm going <laughs> to take a short break. I hope you, hopefully you'll wake up, and then I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about, about this over here. For example, in this room, that let's say 30 students or 40 students, potentially each person is of a different type or chosen from a different type space even, right? Uh, you, could, you could have different type profiles. Uh, this is, in fact, too general. In most cases, all the players are from the same type space but of different values, okay? But this is sort of the most, gen most general formulation of the, of the, of the scheme. Yeah. But no, we don't play one at a time. It's just that in this case, just to keep it simple. Otherwise, you have to say how many customers are there, right? In a, in, a, in a purchase type situation, we only have one customer at a time. We don't have any interaction between the customers themselves, right? So that's where one at a time is adequate. Whereas in a bid, there's interactions between the bidders. So we have to model it this way. Any other questions? Okay, so let me leave this up over here. So I should tell you a story and uh, I'll I need the stuff here. I don't need that over here. 
so what you're going to do is to basically uh, create this. So you, if you're a principal, what you do is you say, OK, I'm going to announce the rules. And I'm going to have some decision process over the strategies. And what I'll do is I'll induce, I'll induce the strategies over here such that I get the right outcome. <coughs> So for example, the strategy that I had for the victory auction was that everybody tells the truth. That's an equilibrium dominant strategy. So what we can do is this. We define the, uh, the uh, mechanism as basically nothing more than these two things over here. So the mechanism, M is a mechanism which is defined as S, which is the product of the uh, S1 times S2. So it's the product of all the strategy spaces. So these strategy spaces are defined. Okay? In other words, the rules of the game are nothing more than telling the agents, OK, you're allowed to play one of these strategies, you're allowed to play one of these strategies, et cetera. And in the case of victory auction, all the strategy spaces are basically the same. That, and the strategy spaces, you're allowed to tell me a bid. Okay? That bid is the strategy space. And we have this value g. And uh, g is, uh, what is g called? Okay, the outcome function. And basically, G maps from S to, uh, so I should probably write it properly. G is a mapping from S to O, OK, the set of outcomes. So given the strategies, G tells you what the outcome is going to be. All right. Uh, now, if we define this F over here to be the mapping from the state of the world to the outcome, what we want is that basically G of S, OK, S star, where S is equilibrium equals F. That's what you want. Okay, whatever F would do, you the game would do it on the strategy spaces as well, given the types of the uh, uh, types of the different uh, uh, players. And you can write this as G of S one star of T one, S two sorry S two star of T two equals F of T one T two. Tn. Okay, so F maps from all the different types of players to some outcome, and we want G to do the same thing. If we do that, then we say that G uh, uh, and S, the mechanism implements social choice function F. So we're just defining that implements the right social choice function over here. Okay, so now we have precise definition. So when somebody says do a mechanism design, what you're going to do is to say, okay, I assume that the players are of these different types. The rules of the game are here, the strategy spaces. In the normal form, this is essentially what are on the rows and column indices. And then I'm going to come up with the dominant strategy equilibrium. And I'll show that a dominant strategy over here, the outcome function of the dominant strategy equilibrium leads to an outcome, which is the exact same outcome if I knew the truth. Okay, then you say that mechanism is successful. It is actually implementing the social choice function f. Okay? So that's basically all the uh, paraphernalia you need. Uh, and we can now write down the, uh, OK. So this is, this is the kind of the mathematical structure under the, under the covers. Um, so one thing I didn't tell you was what this equilibrium was. So before I do that, are there any questions about this so far? I mean, I just tried to formalize essentially the the Vickery auction and uh, the uh, price discrimination scheme in the same general space. And this is perhaps a little bit more general than it needs to be, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a standard formulation. Any questions on this? OK, so what I'm going to do now is to tell you about a little bit about the equilibrium type. So the equilibrium type, what is it? It's saying, OK, I have these strategy spaces. Okay. So recall that a game or an equilibrium of a game or a solution of a game is just telling you what S star is. Okay, the solution of a game tells you what is the best strategy that each player is going to make given, given something, given the solution concept. Okay, if the solution concept is dominant, that's different from Nash, that's different from other things. Right? And so typical solution concepts are used in mechanism design. Most common one is dominant strategy. That means that the that each player in is going to play that 
uh, strategy which is the best for them. Okay, it's as good as or better than any other strategy. We are greater than or equal to over here, so it's as good as or better than just like in the Vickery auction. It was as good as or better to tell the truth than to lie. Okay, so that's a dominant strategy equilibrium. We could also have something called a, a, a Nash equilibrium. Okay, in a Nash equilibrium, what happens is that this strategy S star is the strategy that each player would play, assuming everybody else also played Nash. Right? So that's how Nash works. So Nash says, if everybody else is going to play S star, it's my best response to S minus I star, to play my, my S I star. Right? And so that's a Nash equilibrium. And then we can have something called Bayes-Nash. And Bayes-Nash basically means that uh, I am introducing expectation. So un under my prior knowledge, of all the other players, the Nash equilibrium is going to be the best thing I can do. So assuming I know the types of the other players, assuming they're going to play the Nash equilibrium, then it's best for me not to deviate from Nash equilibrium. That's why it's called Bayes-Nash. Okay. So as you see, each of these makes it harder. So if you have dominant strategy, basically you're in good shape. Okay. Once a game is set up, each agent is going to do that, no matter what, because it doesn't make any sense for them to deviate. When you do Nash, now it gets a bit more complicated. You're assuming that the agents somehow know. First of all, you're assuming hopefully the game only has one Nash equilibrium. And you somehow know that the players all know everybody else's payoffs. And therefore, they're not going to deviate from Nash equilibrium. And in Bayes Nash, not only do we have to assume Nash, we also have to assume that each player has expectations, priors, on the types of all the other players, and then expectation on the other types, they should not then deviate from the Nash equilibrium. So in my view, these things are basically not very good. Okay? There, you, you know, there's lots and lots of papers on Nash and Bayes' Nash equilibria for mechanism design. They're full of mathematical notation, but at the end of it, it's basically not useful. Okay? Because you know, we're talking about in networking, we're talking about you know, basically these games are being played by, by protocols. Right by Wi-Fi protocols and so on and so forth. We don't have any expectations. We don't have uh, ability to deduce what the other people's playoffs are and so on and so forth. All you can hope is that the person writing the protocol is going to do something in a way that maximizes their return, no matter what. Okay, which is dominant. So I well, there are lots of papers on Nash and Bayes Nash mechanism design, and they indeed have some useful properties. Those are not relevant from the computer networking perspective. They're probably relevant in the economic context and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to discuss those. Okay? I'm just going to discuss purely the dominant strategy uh, equilibrium for mechanism design. Okay? Even in other contexts, it's arguable whether uh, Bayes-Nash is, is doable. But anyway, we'll, we'll uh, ignore that for now. All right. So. Given this terminology, I can now write down succinctly what I mean by a dominant strategy equilibrium. So let me write this down. So basically, we're saying that the utility that the ith player gets, ui, from the g function, uh, si star ti, si star uh, team. Oops. S. Oops. Uh, S minus i star t minus i comma t i greater than equal to Okay, so <laughs> ah, it's a good thing I have a big whiteboard or a blackboard. So what I'm saying over here is this: the utility that I get from what? From the strategy S I star, which is the uh, dominant strategy. Okay, As you, this, so G maps from the strategy profile essentially S I star S minus I star. Okay, that's the mapping that G has. 
okay, G is, so this is the standard notation for representing the strategy profile for I playing its strategy SI star, and everybody else is playing basically SI uh, minus star, okay? So this profile for you is greater than it's going to get from essentially any other strategy profile, and this is true for all players and for all strategies other than the dominant strategy and uh, for all types and or, or for all uh, S minus I as well, all the other uh, things that other players could play, right? So basically this means it's dominant, okay? And I've just taken the standard dominant strategy definition and plugged in instead of the SI star, you know, the pi I SI star, the payoff of SI star or S star, I replace the payoff to I from S star with the G function, which basically is a mapping of the outcome anyway, right? And then the utility is on the G function. Okay, so instead of saying uh, UI pi I S star, I've replaced UI pi I with this, and we have the type as the annotation over there because utility depends on the type by definition of utility function. Okay, so you may not understand this in real time, but you probably should go back and you know, make sure that uh, you understand that over here. So this is the dominant strategy mechanism, okay? And if you start putting in expectations, et cetera, then you know, we get one of those Bayes, uh, Nash and Bayes, uh, sorry, and just Nash equilibrium. I'm going to now switch gears a little bit and talk about something else, which is the properties of, the, uh, of, of, a, of a mechanism. And these are the desirable properties. Now, it turns out that uh, we do not actually have mechanisms that satisfy all the properties all the time. Even the victory auction, as you saw, was in fact not satisfying the function exactly. You know, what we got was not what we exactly wanted. We got slightly less, but uh, anyway. So here are the properties we care about. So one thing we care about is individual rationality. This is true, by the way, for any game, not just mechanism design. What it means is nobody can be forced to play the game. Okay, you can't go to somebody and say, you must buy something. You have to. Okay? If it's not rational for them. In other words, if the utility to them from not participating is greater than the utility to them from participating, then they won't participate. Okay? So, so we can't force people to participate. Kind of makes sense. In some mechanisms, it turns out uh, we, we, we can't have that option. You know, people must participate even if they don't want to. So we can't, we, that's not a good idea. It's a thing that's called incentive compatibility. Incentive compatibility uh, basically means that it's in the best interest to cooperate. Okay, so incentive compatibility essentially means you align the incentive of each player with the, with the incentive of the principal. So what the principal does is, okay, these are the rules of the game, and what happens is magically everybody is going to do the right thing because it's the right thing for them as well. Okay, it's like, as I said, the principal wants the agents to do what the principal wants them to do because it's, they want to do it. It's incentive compatible for them to do it. In the victory auction, for example, you announce the rules such that it is in your best interest, that each individual's best interest to bid their true value. Okay, that's what incentive compatibility, uh, compatibility is all about. A similar related term is uh, strategic, uh, Strategic, strategic, or strategy, strategy, proofness. Essentially, same thing, which basically means that it's incentive compatible and dominant strategy. So, technically, if you have an incentive compatible scheme, okay, and it's dominant strategy, then it's also called strategy proof. Okay, there's no strategy you can play that can change the outcomes. You know, it's always best for you to play your, your dominant strategy over here. Uh, okay. Then you get into something that's a bit more interesting. I'm probably going to go over here. So, budget balance. 
So these things are sort of obvious things, right? You want there to be individual rational. Obviously, you can't force somebody to participate. You want incentive compatibility. Otherwise, if somebody's going to play whatever they want, they're not going to play the right thing. Then you don't even have a good game. And strategy proofness is just sort of a, you know, basically saying, I'm, I'm going to use dominant strategy over here. Budget balance gets more interesting. So what's going to happen is that we're assuming quasi-linear utility functions. Each person has a utility for money, all right? And what we do in budget balance, what we do in a mechanism, as we'll see in just uh, well, probably next class, is that in order for the right thing to happen, sometimes the principal has to take money from the people or give them money. Okay. So in the victory auction, for example, you're going to take money from the person for buying something, right? So in a budget balance, we can talk, talk about basically uh, two kinds of budget balance, weak and strong. Okay. In the weak budget balance. Basically, a uh, principal doesn't have to pay out money. Okay, so the principal may take money from people, but doesn't have to pay out money. The principal never is going to lose money from doing the transaction. Okay, and in strong budget balance, basically, all, all, the sum of all flows. Some of all monetary flows is zero. So nobody is losing. I mean, some people are going to lose money, some people are going to gain money, but the principal doesn't lose or gain money. Principal is basically just taking money from some people and giving it to other people. Okay? So think of taxation. Okay? Taxation is a mechanism where you, know, you take money from one class of society and give it to another class of society. Right? In the end, if you hope that the principal the government isn't keeping any money okay, uh, on the side. Okay? In a corrupt government, of course, there's money coming in, less of it goes out. Okay? And then some of it is kept by the principal. In a weak, uh, that would be weak budget balance. Okay? But in a, if you don't have weak budget balance, this is like the government of Alaska. You know, the government pays out money, to pay, or Alberta, I guess. They give you money because uh, that's how they can maintain the, uh, uh, <laughs> maintain the mechanism. Okay, uh, if you're a citizen of Alaska, you actually get, you don't pay income tax, you get a check from the government every year because, uh, you know, you get part of the oil revenue, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so that's budget balance. Uh, fairness. So we would like the, uh, basically it says minimize the variance in the, in the utilities. So all the end, at the end, all the users should have roughly the same amount of utility. That would be a fair uh, mechanism. This is pretty hard to get. Uh, revenue maximization. So this is obviously not going to be working if you're doing strong budget balance. The revenue maximization basically says principal should make as much money as possible. In auction setting, for example, this makes sense. You want to have the maximum possible money you can get. That would be revenue maximization. And finally, a very important concept called Pareto optimality. So Pareto was a famous economist, I think Italian economist, and he decided, he, he, he came up with this very beautiful idea called Pareto optimality. And what it means is that it tells you whether a system is optimal or not, any system is optimal or not. And what it is is based on the concept that, uh, let's say that I have a system with 10 players, okay? It has some outcome. It has some outcome. Let's say that I can somehow increase the value of the outcome to one player by adjusting something, okay? And it, one of two things can happen. Either somebody else is going to have a worse outcome or not, right? Either somebody, so I have 10 people over here, and they each have some outcome, okay? Now, if I bump up this guy over here, Either the other people are affected adversely or not, right? If they're not affected adversely, then what I could have done is I could have given this guy that outcome and everybody would be better off, okay? Then what we'll say is that the prior allocation, whatever it was, was not Pareto optimal, okay? In Pareto optimal situation, the only way anybody can be better off is to make somebody else worse off, okay? The only way that somebody can be better off is 
If you go up, then somebody else comes down. That's Pareto optimal. Pareto optimality is quite weak, okay? For example, let's say I have a pie. I have to divide it into 10 people, okay? I'll give the whole pie to the first person, okay? I'll give the whole pie to the first person. Now, the only way anybody else is going to get even a tiny sliver of the pie is for the first person to give up some of their pie, which they don't like. So the allocation of giving everything, the whole pie to the first person, is Pareto optimal. However, if I have a pie that I divide into the four people, and I divide it into five slices, and I give each person a slice as one slice that goes in the fridge, that is not Pareto optimal, because I could have given that slice to somebody, or divide it into smaller pieces, give it to everybody else, they'd all be happier, and nobody would be less, you know, would be less happy. Okay? So this is a very general economic principle that's very widely used, it's very, very applicable in a bunch of networking situations as well. You want to design mechanisms which are at least Pareto optimal. If they're not Pareto optimal, you really messed up. Okay, because what you're saying is, if I just change this slightly over here, everybody's better off. Or at least one person is better off and nobody else is worse off. And so we want Pareto optimality in the mechanism as well. We want to make sure that the outcomes are such that they're not, we're not being inefficient you know, for some reason. Okay, any questions about, about that? So these are some of the kind of things that we'd like when designing G and S. Okay, we want to choose the rules of the game which are G and S, such that the game has all these different properties. And in fact, we'll find that uh, no, you, can't, you can't always do it. Okay, we can't always do it. Okay, so I'm going to now outline a specific principle called revelation principle. I'll kind of go over it once and probably I'll return to it next time uh, as well. It's, okay, so what's the revelation principle? Okay, so, so far, I've just given you like a very high level view of what mechanisms could be, and we looked at a bunch of different possibilities. Now, we have said nothing about what G looks like or what S looks like. Okay, strategies could be anything, and gains could be, uh, the, the outcome function could be anything at all. But it turns out that there's sort of a hidden simplicity and a very big hidden assumption in, game, in mechanism design that you should be aware of. The mechanism, uh, the, the hidden assumption, which is really very critical, is that the, we assume P knows, the principle knows the form of U sub I, okay? Essentially, it knows everything except type. So what do you mean the form versus type, okay? So uh, for example, let's say that I have a user who has some type, and let's say the type is just the integer in the range, you know, 1, 200. Then I could say that the utility i is of the form t minus price, just as a very simple, sorry, t sub i minus price, okay, where price is something that I'm going to tell you, so the principle tells the user this is your price. So it's just a simple linear relationship. Or maybe the price, maybe it's going to be ti squared by two uh, mi no, minus price. For example, twice price, I don't know. Okay, everything is known about this equation except one number over here, the ti. That is the kind of uh, secret behind mechanism design or the, you know, the, I don't know, the secret of the shame, which is that it really only works when the principal knows already that every agent has this particular form. So it's a kind of a tricky situation because we said the utilities are, are uh, uh, you know, non -comp are private information. So what we've done is we said, okay, it's not actually private. There's one part of it, the value, which is private, TI is private. And actually, your form is known to the principle, okay? And without this, you can't actually build a mechanism. If everything was, in fact, private, you couldn't actually do it, okay? So if you know the form of the utility function and the only hidden thing is ti, then what happens is that the mechanism becomes actually quite easy because you think about it, let's say that this, I have this set of strategies space s, okay? I have some strategy s, that's a set of strategies, 
who designed it? The principal did, right? The principal already knows what S is. So this is all the possible choices you could make. Now, the only difference that the user can make, the player can make, is to have this private value TI. Okay, so if, if they, for example, you take the victory auction, the strategy says announce a bid. Okay, announce a bid. The only thing that the individual has control over is what the bid value is, the T sub I, right? So even if you take more complex mechanisms, okay, if you have lots and lots of different choices that you could have in your game, you know, maybe you could have 200 different choices, ultimately what's going to happen is the player is going to make a move that is based on their individual type TI, and then after that, the form of the utility function is known, the outcome is known, the strategies are known. So here's what you could do. The principal could go to the agent and say, just tell me TI, why bother playing the game? Okay, why do you want to do all through all the strategies and this and that? I'm telling you the strategies anyway, and I know what utility function looks like other than one hidden parameter over here, so just tell me what your TI is, and I'll play the game for you. I'll simulate the game as if it, I'm going to, and then I'm going to tell you what the outcomes are. Okay, I'm going to run G on it, tell you what the outcomes are. After all, all you care about is just G. So why don't you just tell me T, and I'll tell you the uh, outcome O, and we're done. Right? And this is what's called the revelation principle. Okay? The revelation principle essentially says that any mechanism that makes this assumption, that P knows the form of U, and the only hidden parameter is one value t. P is anyway going to uh, design S as it wishes, and the only hidden thing is over here. So any mechanism that is general can be reduced to a mechanism which simply asks for the user, for each player, to specify the type directly. And then what the principal does is to simulate the rest of the game. Okay, so well, if your type is C, you know, the chatter type, then your utility function is like this, because all you needed to know was this one value, and then your outcome is going to be this. So here, this is your outcome already. Go to, you know, this is the game that this is what you should do. And uh, all the other stuff can just be kind of ignored. Okay, so which means that in, uh, in, in a game, we can at least, we only need to analyze those games or those mechanisms which are of the direct revelation type, okay, where the, where the uh, individuals, in fact, tell you what the type is, and we don't need to actually worry about the strategy. So in a more specific sense, direct revelation can be just written in one single equation. It basically says S equals T. So the strategy space is the same as your types, type space. So whatever your type is, that's the strategy you play. You just say, play, you just play, my type is this. And of course, you may lie about it, right? I haven't said it's incentive compatible. All I said was that all you can tell the principle, the only game you can, only move you can make in this game is to say, my type is T sub I. And after that, the principle has, knows what S is, it knows the T, it knows uh, what the utility functions should look like. So now basically it computes all the outcomes and it does all the outcomes right there, okay? And why does it need to know the form of the utility function? It needs to know the form of the utility function because when it chooses the game, it's going to decide the game such that no matter what your type is, the, uh, 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 it's incentive compatible for you. So incentive compatibility over here requires that the uh, principle knows the form of the utility function. Okay, otherwise it cannot make it incentive compatible. Okay, if I don't know the utility, if I don't know what your utility function is, I cannot make sure that, in, that a dominant strategy equilibrium is going to make it best for you, right? I have to choose the game, so I have to have some information, and the information I need is the form of the utility function, and only one little thing is kept hidden from me. And if you tell me that, S equals T, then I can implement any mechanism I want. And that's basically the direct revelation principle. Okay, are there any questions about this? Okay, so let's stop here, and then I'll talk about next time about a specific, uh, what's called a direct revelation principle, uh, the VCG mechanism.